esteem your experience with the land. I mean, were you itching to start writing your own stuff? Oh God, yes. Well, you know, in many ways, it was such a claustrophobic experience. Although I loved lots of the music, I mean, it seemed like the, the keyboard parts were getting denser, so it was harder to impose. Um, songs and lyrics on, on top of those and hard to find a moment to, you know, what would I do? Would I just join the bass line? Would I just strum along with the chords? Harder and harder to find relevant things for the guitar to do. So over time, uh, with all the other problems that attended, attended it, I started to amass solo material. God forgive me, guys, but I just thought it's the only way to go to get ideas across is, is, is just to, uh, is to just negotiate with myself in the end. And luckily, both Phil and, and Mike were a fantastic rhythm section on that first album. I don't think it would have gotten made if, if they had been paid? around for that. I don't remember. No, I don't remember much about that. Do you know <laughs> I remember the thing. Okay. Do you remember the thing? No, well, I enjoyed it. It was uh, yeah. Kingsway, that studio. Kingsway. Nice. Yes. Kingsway Recorders, yeah. yeah. Aviation House fun. in the basement. And uh, you couldn't record until six o'clock at night because it was a government building. And uh, Fleetwood Mac had. Uh, recorded there um and uh it was, it was it was great sorry guys it was great but it was it was a version of genesis but it wasn't genesis i was working with these guys and uh lovely to work with my brother of course but you know it's purely selfish you did ask me about this and i enjoyed the process so much but for me i always felt that you know i wasn't writing as much as the other guys but by the time you do a solo thing it forces you to come up with lots and lots of material. It's like turning on the tap, and I couldn't, I couldn't switch it off after that. Then I, after that, it was verbal diarrhea and lots of songs coming out, and probably far too much for the band to be able to use. But, um, but there you are. That's the yeah. way bands are. They manage to contain everyone's yearnings yeah, I think, for a while. I mean, the way, the way you know, we're laying all the cards on the table. I mean, the way I remember it. Again, time can distort things, but was um, that we didn't necessarily, because there was five, five people in the band, we didn't necessarily use 20% of each, of the material wasn't divided up equally, you know. And um, because I didn't write, full stop. Really. My, my strength was, as I said before, was, was much more about how seeing other people's material could be arranged. So that was, I felt that that was kind of my role and as a player. And I just, I think maybe there was, you know, this back, this, this kind of surplus of material arriving with Steve because we weren't using it or the band, you know, to sort of put the blame onto something else, the band rather than us, we're not using it. And um, I think there was a certain amount of, of, you know, who shouted the loudest and got the most grumpy if their bit wasn't used, you know, which was me. Yeah, well, I mean, I did probably get more on than other people, you know, and that's, so you've either got me to blame or to love for the music. But, you know, the, you know it's, it's... Or both. Or both, yeah, that's it. I tend to get a bit of both. But it's, um, I don't know really, I just sort of, you know, you want to get your stuff out, don't you? And I, just, I could be pretty bullshy and... And it tended to happen like that. But I mean, I think it's a lot of things, you know, you could, once it was in the, the, the group domain, you could then arrange it as a group and it would become group, you know. I mean, In the Cage being a prime example or something like that. I mean, the, not the solo part, which is something we did on the, in the rehearsal room, but the, the basic song and chorus, verse and choruses, that was something I'd done. And I'd seen it done completely differently. I saw it as a sort of a big kind of, you know, rather sort of a slow kind of piece and everything. And then when Phil put the drums on, it started to become completely different to that. And then, you know, people, the lyrics on, and it became something, it became a sort of real rock song, which I'd never seen it being originally. And I think it worked really well for that. And, you know, there's many other examples of that within the group, you know, so it's a... It's you know, that, that Steve's the first one to do what became the most natural thing for all of us, you know what I mean? Projects outside the band, which after a while became the most natural thing to do. We couldn't imagine out them, I think, but you were the first one sort of to realize that, I suppose, in a way. Because you'd, you'd done band stuff outside, hadn't you, by then? But I'd done, well, Brand X. Brand X was, yeah. He was, always, was that, was that which, was, yeah. which came first, Brand X or Steve? Brand X Steve's? was around the same, well, it was 74, I remember mm. it was being. You know, yeah. that, was, that was just, I was just there, you know, a band that Island Records had that didn't really know what to do with it. And uh, I just... I love to play, you know, so I went along and I just played with them. Moonlight, basically. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was... 
I, I didn't have any plans on a solo career. I mean, in, in I guess one could simplify things and say that, that Pete was the first one to have a solo career, but it, it, it didn't break out because, you know, until you left the band, Steve was the next to actually do it inside the band. And then... Um, uh, talking about your solo career, Pete, Pete um, uh, looking into this, we... Um, well, we're all here listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, right. And, uh, in order to prepare myself, I listened again to Peter Gabriel's three and Intruder track. Phil had talked quite a bit about it. Yeah. Thank you. Phil and who then, who then brought it to the band. And, yeah. You came on the sort of like, what, what, what's really interesting is that you left, but your the kind of influence of your ideas or something that you brought to it, which was kind of this pairing away the less is more idea. So it was like land was this huge massive thing, and you know it was almost over the top and too much. And then you, you leave, pair away. Start to find uh, sounds in the silence, spaces in the silence, and bringing in and sim simplifying. And then it comes back to Genesis, who then start to develop through this approach a, a different sound themselves. Did that ever occur to you? Not really. I mean, um, how it sort of happened for me is that we, Intruder was a sort of more normal track with a whole band of different musicians playing. And then one of the Hugh Padgham had done something um, with these SSL uh, gated reverb that um, he tried on XTC and and it was, but it was just in amongst the, the mix. Then he tried it um, on Phil's drums and I'd asked Phil to do a really simple pattern there. And it just sounded like the future of drums and I was so blown away that I wanted to strip everything back off the track and have this be the absolute center of it. And, you know, and it be, I think it was a, a very much copied um, sound, uh, but uh, I didn't feel that I was in any way um, continuing to influence at that point. It, it, it was a hugely influential album. I think it d dictated the course of production for the whole of the 80s, where where drums became the central focus, that sort of compressed ambient thing. Yeah, I, I would say, though, that, you know, it's very it's easy to look back and say, well, this led to this. I mean, I don't think any of us... Well, I don't think that we were paying it that much attention to... I mean, uh, I think... I mean. It, well, I think one thing we're looking for is that the thing about that sound is particularly in the, it, it's sort of it's it's like a live sound, but but more so almost really. And I think one thing that Mike and I always wanted to try and do a little bit, which Phil was slightly more reluctant to do in the early days, was to simplify a bit. We really liked sort of we were big fans of Kashmir by Led Zeppelin, and that sort of that simplicity of that drum part, the sound of it, is fantastic. And to some extent, that's a little bit what this sounds like, without the holes. You know, the holes are perhaps what really makes this special, but it's that incredibly big live sound. You know, we, we did a song on Trick of the Tail, the first album without Peter, Squonk, where we were trying to get that kind of sound, but we had completely the wrong never did producer for that. And to be honest, at that point, Phil wasn't really playing like that. He was, you know, he had everything tuned in such a way that it was kind of smaller, because that was kind of where he was, the sort of jazz rock thing, you know. <laughs> and... Um, we sort of got closer to it on, on Los Endos when we actually did the, you know, the reprise of Squonk, I think. But that we did with more sort of synthetic drums and everything as well to try and get that sound. So we've sort of been searching for it. But when we heard the, the yeah, intruder I, loop, we just thought that was fantastic. I think sound. one of the key things was, was one sentence, which I remember, you know, what is a forgotten era? And it only had, was only there for a short period, was Peter didn't have, uh, you correct me if I've got, I got it completely wrong, but but Peter didn't have a band around the time of in, uh, the third album. 
the story I remember being told, maybe it was by Gail, but the, basically it was a very expensive American band. Couldn't really, the, you know, the financial logistics weren't going to hold up to have a band on hold while this material was being put together, knowing the time that it sure. took you. <laughs> but, and so I said, well, I'm doing nothing, you know, because I'd, I'd been through my great sorrow. Um, so I, I volunteered my services as, as a drummer, and I went down with John Giblin and uh, with Jeff Wesley and Joe Partridge, I think, yeah. to Bath, and we all stayed you know, because Peter was going to do some shows and we all learnt some Ready. of the old songs, we had a great time, and we started to work on some of the material that was to turn up on the third album, uh, Margarita, which was oh, yeah. uh, uh, Wallflower, I remember. Um, and we kind of d did all that and we did a lot of the version of The Lamb as, a, as an encore, I remember. I mean, it was about yeah. half a dozen shows. Was it Lamb or New York City, maybe? Maybe it was New York City. I think. I don't know who played, Joey Marotta must have been there for some of it because he right. played the drums on that while you and I sang. You know? Right. I think. Yeah. But, um, but nobody ever talks about that, you know. Um, but the key thing, because that band, well, I, I was part of that band that we brought into the studios, maybe reluctantly by Steve Lillywhite, to, to play on some of the album that was going to be, and I played on Family Snapshot, yep. and I played on Wallflower, and no self-control, sorry. No self-control. And, um, and Peter said, I don't want any cymbals. I don't want any cymbals on this. And, I, and, and for a drummer, that was, you know, that was big deal. You know, oh, hang on, well, what's this hand supposed to do? Um, so we set up the drums so that there was a drum instead of a cymbal in that particular position in case I had the urge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like... Um, but... Uh, that was a, uh, kind of the most important, that I think did, that sentence kind of did set kind of the tone for some of the, you know, because with the, it left the space which, which uh, symbols tend to cover over. And, and I remember it, well, I had my headphones on and I was in the live drum room at the townhouse in, in Shepherd's Bush and Hugh was mucking about with these SSL gates and, and I started to play tsh Oh, what's that? You know, because the sound cut off. You know, and I started to to write this pattern, which is a very John Bonham esque pattern, uh, playing with the sound I was hearing in the headphones as as she was adjusting all the gates. And then I, you know, I remember Peter saying, "What was that?" And I said, "Well, I'm playing with what I what I hear." And he said, "Well, give me that for ten minutes." And nothing and, else. <laughs> and nothing else. You don't change it. You know. Mm. And um, which is the beauty of a drum machine, you know, because drummers won't do that. They, <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, so they was just, it a loop with you? in something here or there yeah. because they get bored. Where you know, I just religiously played that for for, for however long it was, five, six, ten minutes. And um, and I remember saying to Peter, "What are you going to do with it?" Because I kind of felt that I'd come up with the the riff, as it were. But it was obviously his album, you know. So uh, and, and Peter was kind enough to sort of to give me a little credit on the on the, the credit on the songwriting credit. But um, I think that that did, I mean, uh, change a lot of things production-wise. But I and then when I was looking for someone to, to that was sympathetic to a, to have the drums that loud in a mix, I thought this is my man, you know. And so that's why I used G Padgham on Face Value, because I thought this guy could. You know, he understood what, what drummers were about because he was obviously coming up with some great and unique sounds. And, then, uh, and that's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> but I don't know. Um, but when, when you listen to Man track, um, that it's so, it seems so connected sonically to um, The Intruder. Um, you had got that great, you know, uh, the John Bonham esque. Sound, but it, 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 what intrigues me about it is that after we land, which is all multi layered and you know, prog rock, masterpiece, etc., um, a few years later, you're, you're really s separating out things, and um, it seems it seemed to me that you were pretty influential in that, and it's kind of a nice thing, really, where, that you go back, your influence back on Genesis in you know, the 80s. 
Um, it's sort of like a little bit of a... Well, I love this line of inquiry. Yeah, <laughs> don't, don't, don't give me all that stuff. You know, <laughs> start asking for royalties for God's sake. Come on, that. I think we were, personally speaking, was a big fan of his third and fourth albums. You know, I just thought that I just thought the sound was fantastic, and I liked that sort of simplicity and pared down thing. It probably did influence us all, I think, to some extent. You know, but um, you know, it's, it's sort of everything kind of comes together. Really, you you want. I think you change mentally. You know, and it's the idea that. You know, sometimes doing all the sort of the, the, the stuff we did in the early days was, was because we didn't have the confidence to let it rest, you know. You kind of did it one other thing, you thought, well, I'll do this, do that. And, and if you suddenly set up a great mood, and I think the Intruder thing was an example of that, you, you, you could just listen to that, I mean, forget about the song, you could listen to that drum riff for 10 minutes, and it sounded fantastic, you know, which we did. And it taught you that you could just stick within a simpler format. You've got to build up a great mood and just do little things to kind of just make it work and not disturb that original yeah, mood. It's a natural, natural thing. Uh, well, well, you know, you, you change. You, 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 of course you're influenced by other things, but you would change if it is, that's the kind, you know, without the intruder or, or that whole area, you know, uh, of, of sound. I mean, the suggestion is that maybe that we'd have just carried on doing the similar thing, you know, the same old thing. And I think we all we all changed. I mean, we're all developing. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I, the punk thing was happen, you know, was about to happen, and that simplified things. And, you know, that had probably a subliminal effect on what we we scaled down. You know, the drum sound got a bit bigger, yeah, but we scaled down the, our writing on Abercab and things. I think it's. Um, you know, the changes that were going to happen anyway. But it's, if you want a thread to go back to somewhere, it's a it's, it's possible connection, you know. But and the other trouble is, you know, just that length of time, you know, you start to become a caricature of yourself because you've been going so long. So unless you try and go somewhere else, you end up just going around the sort of same, same areas again. And I think all creative people are, in the end, just like dogs in the park. You know, you sniff something interesting and you try and jump on it. And, and when, you know, <laughs> yes. we, we've always been like that, I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's simple. So I think, you know, if you can trace the influences of certain artists, certain bands, certain things through, you know, pretty much any song, there, there will be references to other things that have been important to any of us growing up. I can always tell where we've been sniffing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just ask me about Salisbury Hill. Is it a song about leaving Genesis? I certainly wasn't aware that it was a song about leaving Genesis at the time. I think inevitably, whatever you do is coloured and shaped by whatever's going on in your psyche. So um, for me, it w I mean, everyone thinks, you know, walking out of the machinery and the lyric or whatever is walking out of Genesis. And that certainly wasn't in my head. But it... And yet it must have been. So, um, not on a conscious level. I never sat down and said, oh, I'll write this about leaving the band. It, it was more just trying to explore and explore things and, um, well. It was a great 12 string riff, by the way. And I remember yeah. Mike saying, I wish I'd played on that. And then, of course, you did when you did, or we did the live thing, oh, the yeah. joined for the encore. Yeah. But, I forgot that. He yeah, did, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there who, was a Genesis who, who, was spirit. Was it a piano riff? At work. How did it start? It started as a piano riff. Yeah. You didn't master the guitar in the meantime, did you? <laughs> I wish. No, Steve Hunter played it very well. Uh, and yeah. everyone, everyone who tries yeah. to play it since then uh, struggles. What was the um, event in the uh, early 80s when you were running out of money? You had a, a one off show, you came back. Well, what was that? That was Womad, um, which was, you know, again, full of naive idealism and not too much practical <laughs> wisdom. Um, I gathered a group of people to put on a festival, you know, to celebrate all these fantastic musicians, it was art and dancers, film from around the world that wasn't getting exposure. And absolutely brilliant event, but a disaster in the box office. And, uh, and I was getting sort of... Uh, a death threats on the phone because we couldn't pay the bills and uh and i think tony then very kindly talked to the band and said look maybe if we could 
get everyone together and with Peter, we can raise some money and uh, help him pay off because the debts were beyond what I was capable of paying uh, at that time. And they very generously um, agreed to do this one-off uh, thing. And it was, uh, it was stuck in between a bit of touring, so we didn't really get the chance to rehearse properly. And it's Hammersmith Odeon. Is that right? Yeah, no, yeah. it was the middle of that. Yeah, we did a five-night run, yeah. I think, at Hammersmith, and you came down in the afternoon. So, so I think it was a bit rough and ready, and it was pissing down. So the audience, very devoted fans, some of whom come from sort of Argentina and America, so Soviet countries, it, uh, to see this thing. And it, uh, and it, it was emotionally, it, it felt... Um, Fantastic. Yeah, it was, it was very nice, and, and I think we all quite... In, enjoyed it, but I think musically it didn't deliver in quite the same way that we'd imagined it would. But it was the gesture, wasn't it? it was, well, yeah. I think the, the other thing, I remember at the time we were quite keen not to film it, because we thought it was going to be a little bit rough and ready, but actually, on reflection, we should, we should have done what's all, who, who really cared? Well, we, well, a bit like, well, we might quite laugh, but you No, know, I'm really <laughs> sorry. It's just, it's well, the homelessness. I was I being pretty, some of them very few, yes. Yeah, and I was always the one who objected to the idea of filming things, because I was obsessed with trying to get it right for film, and and in fact, when we did some in old in Strat days at uh, Shepperton, um, that was on a very specific proviso that if we weren't happy and if I wasn't happy, the thing would be destroyed. And of course, I wasn't happy, and it was never destroyed. <laughs> I mean. The, the it's difficult for people to understand, probably now, or put it into perspective. I mean, there was no mobile phones. And, you know, now it'll be on YouTube. I was about to find, you know, I was about to catch myself and say, isn't it on YouTube? But of course, there was no way of, you know, people yeah. won't be doing this. So it's really just, you know, the odd photograph. And well, the moment you stepped out of a coffin, <laughs> that set the tone. Really. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What, what brought that up there? Well, actually, as it was an idea, Screaming Jay Hawkins used to arrive on stage in a coffin so that he should get the credit. But I just thought, um, you know, if, if we're doing this thing, we might as well ham it up a little and have some fun. So um, uh, I was uh, just enjoying myself, really. My, my memory of it actually was you trying to play the drums on Turn On Again. Is that right? Yeah, I'm not even realised that it's got an extra beat every third bar or something, you know, so oh, you're right. doing what? You know, guys. Because <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound unnatural, it sounds perfectly normal, you know, but actually he's trying to play along. It's also the anniversary, one of Tony Smith's managerial anniversaries. My birthday. Was it Milton Keynes? Was it? Uh, October the Milton 2nd, Kings, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. How many years? I think that was his birthday. <laughs> Oh, there's a picture right? of a cake backstage, but maybe... It was my birthday cake, yes. It was your birthday cake as well. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that we had... Because, you know, when it rains anywhere, but when it rains in England and you're playing, it's terribly depressing. You get this sort of mist, <laughs> and it's like everything's slightly damp on stage, even though you're covered. And it, it kind of... The whole thing was a bit like that. I, I, I wish it had been a sunny day and we could all have enjoyed it. Yeah, in October, you know, it was not warm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's Genesis open air. Let's have it in October. Yeah. Why, was it, why was it in? Or was it just cash flow? Was it money? It was just because... Uh, oh, we got shot. Yeah, we could get... No, we could get more, more bums on seats and raise more money. And then the bloody liquidators forged one of the WOMAD director's signature to try and get their 10% uh, commission out of the... Proceeds from that concert it made me livid. Did they get it? No, we. Uh, but you remember that? It's extraordinary. Shady, yeah, it's, it's like a shady old world liquidators. I think we're going to. Uh, Sorry, yeah. I should I should make my excuse and leave at this point, shouldn't I? <laughs> Have an empty chair from now on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what part of us? So uh, through all these different places. You know, um, your period into the band, Peter, uh, Steve period of the band. Phil actually left and seems to have come back. Um, and these two have been there all the way through, right from the beginning to the end. And I oh, started to the future. Um, Let's have a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so that was where it was going. Just I never thought of anything better to do. Just, 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 no one else would have it. You're going to hang. <laughs> Is it, is it inevitable that there, there seems to be this thing where people divide and very divided on, you know, the go on like all these obsessive fans who love what it's called the Gabriel era, as opposed to the people who completely mad with film, mad on film, love film, and, you know, but it's almost as though they're never between your me. Um, do you understand any of that? Is it, is it a load of nonsense? What, what do you make of it? I think fans will always do that, you know, it's like same with sports teams, you know, our, it's the thing you were growing up with that probably is the thing that you attach yourself. And I think the years probably, I don't know, 16 to 25 or maybe even 22, the things that really impress you then are the things that, you know, somehow when you're trying to forge your own identity and place in the world, if there are some bands or sports heroes or whatever that fit in with that particular period, then I think you're particularly glued to how you remember it and liked it at the time. I don't know. Would you? No, I absolutely agree with that. I'd just bring it back a bit to 13 to 19. I think there's a sort of crucial thing, and we used to do this sometimes when people said, oh, we like this, we like this, like that. You'd ask them what, how old they were, during the period of the album they think is our best album. You know, you always, they were in their teenage years. It's, it's, it's just, it stays with you in that kind of way, really, you know, and because the band has changed, we've evolved, various things have happened, but it's not quite so neatly into the Gabriel and Collins eras. I mean, there's the, the period, certainly, of Trick of the Tail through to Duke, those albums, which are sort of still definitely progressive albums, and, you know, so don't really fall into either camp. And then you get this thing too that a lot of people compliment me on Trick of a Tale when I wasn't actually there. So it's reflected <laughs> well, uh, glory. One yeah, of the finest but, moments. Yeah, but it, but it's so I think you know people are hazier in their heads sometimes about actually who was what and where. And the film gets slack for not being Peter. Um, do you get slack for not being Phil? Well, no, because I'm, I'm history then, you know, and the band were much more successful without me than they were with me. So it was sort of, um, yeah, you know, it was, it was a chapter. You know, I think Pink Floyd, there was a slight similarity with Sid Barrett, you know, or something. It was a, a different incubation period and something else emerged. Uh, we have five minutes left. Yeah. Um, the influence of the, the album covers. Not, not necessarily yeah. at all, but there's a, there's a great uh, kind of the sense of the, the period and the, the kind of lushness, the English countryside, the, you know, the rural idyll in a way, like nursery crime is not so, so much an idyll for this <laughs> sense of going to get struck by a croquet um, and, and fox trot. Selling in is fantastic, but all those things were really thought out uh, argued uh, over. Mm. <laughs> Throw different ideas at you. Yeah, and I, I think too, when the things got a little too pretty, you know, like the, you stick the knife in it, or you have the heads in the croquet lawn, or so there was a bit of dark. We, I think, we're always trying to balance. You know, even in, in Betty Swanick's painting, we asked her to paint a black leather glove on the uh, hand of, was it the boy? I can't remember. Um, but, so there were little, I think it was always trying to balance uh, the fantasy with something a little darker. And the boxer's head off the lady. Uh, that was actually um, a Paul Whitehead's creation. Um, and he, I think, generated that without any of us, as far as I remember. Um, and we'd actually met him at the Spitting Image studio. You remember? Because he was, well, he was working with Luck and Floor, I think. Oh, I and, um, um, but, but it was a Spitting Image may not have been in existence. But, they, 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 but they had, a, they had a studio, which I think he was, yeah, was one of the artists. Father, yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, and then I remember Paul Conroy, who, you know, later ran stiff, but he was at one point our agent and then working in Charisma and was great sort of ideas man as well. He suggested that 
he walk around, I think, or get someone to walk around, you know, in the um, fox's head and red dress. And then, and I thought, no, actually, you know, I should do that. And I remember the first gig was in um, Dublin, Dublin, Dublin in, in this old sort of boxing ring. And, uh, um, and I managed to get myself into one of my wife's um, Again. Red dresses. <laughs> Again. Shh. You said you'd never mention it. <laughs> and, um, and then we had this fox head made. Um, and there was a real silence when I came out. Uh, I'm not, I think it was not just the drag thing, but it was, it was dark. It was a sort of dark energy. And, and it was scary to people and shocking. And, we thought, oh, this is interesting. Let's uh, play around with this some more. Well, we didn't know it was going to happen that first time. That is that right? Did I? No, but it, 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 it was so a front cover, of course. So, uh, you know, Melody it, Maker once again. Yeah, so. you came, it was the end of Musical Box, which was wasn't idea. terrifically appropriate, but you came on from where you later wore the old man's mask. And, oh, you know, right. just, we were just sort of doing it. You know, da -da -da. <laughs> What's happening? It's very spiritual. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad you remember that. Because, I mean, that was the time when I think you felt that if you told anybody, we'd have said no. And that's yeah. the one time we definitely would have done, I think. <laughs> definitely coming out like that. And but thank, was, thank know, God it ended up on the front page of Melody yeah, Maker. That's right, because then we so, thought, so thought the, well. Yeah. I, I won the argument. Okay. Instant <laughs> sanction. Yeah. Didn't affect the music, you know, that's all we really cared about. So after, it's funny how the album comes, I was thinking, yours have always been, you're on the cover, your face on the cover. Always your album covers and yours too. Is that right? After your oh yeah, we never done it before. Yeah, right. It's funny you both you both did that. We're des desperate to have their face on the front of the cover. Well, we reluctantly <laughs> we reluctantly put <laughs> on, on the abacab. We, we put our a picture of us on the inside sleeve. Yeah, yeah and they still sold some records. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, it was stall. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's a very different look. Yeah, totally. Different. Do you remember anything? I always felt Storm and Poe, I mean, I think I'm probably right, actually, so it's not just me, but they kind of felt it was a little difficult because, you know, we'd gone to them and they had a lot of success and, and they therefore knew best and we were always being a little picky, I mean, um, about what we wanted and... And we weren't quite as big as the Floyd. We weren't quite as important as other bands that they were, they were doing covers for. And we were a bit of a thorn in their sides. I always got that impression that. Storm. Well, Storm's a bully. He was a bully, Storm. Wasn't he? Yeah. So yeah, I loved him to death. But he was, he, but he was provocatively difficult, and enjoyed being so. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and so he he try and wind you up, you know, and and and. Um, you know, he give you this idea and, and tells you that, you know, Led Zeppelin and Floyd had both rejected this one. <laughs> but yeah. It was good enough for you. Yeah. <laughs> no, but th there was an idea that he presented to us and everyone said no and it ended up as a, as a Zepp cover and it's that one with the black thing standing in the middle of the table. People sitting around like, sorry, oh, yeah, I can't remember yeah, the name yeah, of the yeah, album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Looked pretty good, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember that the one that yeah. 10CC ended up using with the map going across the front. Yeah. Another one we turned down at some point. You know, I bought you the days to show you, actually. I've got one of my covers. He brought down like 12 little, you know, little sort of little cards yeah. of ideas. I'll yeah. show you them. And you go, I've seen that one since. I mean, yeah, yeah no, nice, but actually. He was, he was a king of recycling before it was popular. Oh. Yeah. But um, so at the same that. time, you know, I think I was, I could give Storm a good run for awkwardness. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, so when it came down to, um, Choosing the right faces for for the lamb and, and getting that cover right, we went through a lot, a lot of photos and a lot of people. Uh, the, the final um, images on the on the lamb is kind of the you know it's, it, it's very it's, it's simple it's black and white it's, it's world away from the, you know the English countryside so, yeah which which is sort of the idea of that. Paranoid, uh, yeah, well, it felt like there should be some new departure for the band. I think I'm going to cut, folks. Good. Um, yes. 
Unless any one of you has something else you wish to pitch uh, in on. Uh, yeah. But to debate further, but I think I've probably driven in the end, you know, the energy is kind of flagging. <laughs> yeah, and the bladder is full. The bladder is full. You know, those bladders are full. You did it with old men, yeah, but that's Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And then, stick you up on the, just stand up and play around a bit, just the fun. Play around a bit. Try to shoot the stills and ruts. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, <there we> go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Honestly. If you are, I can take it. Can't get us, everybody. Oh, we could just about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's okay. go on. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs>